fact, I'm going to speed through um, a fair bit of this because uh, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the background. Uh, so I'll go through these fairly quickly, but I've included them in the presentation, presuming that the presentation will be made available to you and you can reference them and they're at the back of the reference. Okay. Um, this draws heavily on uh, the presentation that uh, Paul Neaton gave at Aris. I mean, my slides are cut. His were all very drab and grey. <laughs> Okay, um, Aris UK, I've got to uh, acknowledge, just funded part of RepNet. Um, we're the lead partner, uh, but the bulk of the development goes on with Cranfield. <coughs> and uh, sorry, evidence base are involved in the uh, user evaluation side. We've got them involved. Uh, a bit of history came out of Pyrus 2, um, which you can look up on. We, we basically wanted to um, prove that technically this kind of stuff was possible. Could operate and gather article level information wherever it be. So, multiple instances of articles, uh, you could gather the information together just to remove that technical obstacle <coughs> from the, the discussions. Um, uh, then we decided to, you stole my joke, which was take the P out of Pyrus um, because there were a lot of political issues associated on the publisher side, which are basically okay, what's the business drive for me providing article level use of stats? I don't provide them at the moment, I provide them at the journal level, why should I produce that article? We didn't want to get into that, uh, but we knew that we could do it for institutional repositories, <coughs> technically. And um, if you're going to search for it, you need, there's a link there for Pyrus. For God's sake, put the two on, because if you do a Google search for Pyrus, you'll find out that uh, the Pyrus were the Forers, the Bloods in uh, LA. So, uh, fortunately, we found that out before we had a load of red t-shirts printed to give out in the US. <laughs> okay. uh, the institutional repository scope, um, why would we want to do it? Well, it's for all those noble reasons. Uh, but basically, we aimed to collect usage data from the IRs. That's not record views, this is download material. Not just articles either. Okay, so all item types, and we'll come back to that. Um, they should be counter compliant, although the scope of this is larger than the uh, counter <coughs> article level code of practice that I'll, I'll mention. Um, and we want to be able to return those stats back to the originating repositories for their own use. <coughs> That's not just the stats. I mean, we will QA them, but there is an opportunity to supplement the metadata that we return. Because we soon found that there was no DI, uh, DOI uh, that we could. Uh, find within the metadata easily and so as part of Pyrus we did the matching against Crossref using fully populated you know, uh, article title authors and we, we were successful in about 80% of the cases. So if you downloaded this that would be an easy way just to say okay for my institutional reference identifier I've now got a DOI I can supplement the data. So you, you could get your technical provider the, uh, whoever looks after your IR to make that kind of insertion but it would be in your gift. We wouldn't be doing it remotely. Uh, and then these are more general. If you've got a picture across IRs, what can you, what kind of things can you do? So it's the benchmark and that kind of stuff. Um, and also, the last one here uh, is an opportunity to just do things once, so minimise duplication. So, for example, the conformance with um, open air. If we're aggregating all the stats, we can just do it on your behalf. You know, all we'll need to worry about and keep up with version changes, although there may be very good reasons why each IR should be uh, open air compliant, fully open air compliant, but if you look at the guidelines, it takes a while to read it. Uh, so, anyway. It's a laudable aim. I'll just say a bit about um, the gathering of the data. <coughs> there were two options, really. Uh, one was this idea, of, it's basically, um, do we get the IR to push to, a, to the central space or do we pull it? So it's this uh, tracker code is what we called it, but it's like Google Analytics pushing of information or do we go on the harvesting, which is really where um, open air comes from, they're keen on the harvesting idea, do we pull the metadata through? We opted for the tracker because it's easier um, and we, it's, it's technically easier to implement and also we um, uh, chopped down the amount of metadata that had to be supplied by the institutional repository. So we've just come down to a key pair. For those of you, uh, I mean, you can ignore most of the noise on the screen. This is uh, Z3988 
2004, means this is an open URL. It's a nice open URL. Okay? In here, there are certain mandatory items such as the timestamp, the IP of the uh, requesting machine, and um, the client type, so we use that to identify robots. And then this thing is the OAI identifier from the institutional repository. That's the key bit. This one here, you can see it's the Prince HUD. It's from Huddersfield. That's the, that's the identifier, the thing you're after. We recommend that you put the format, so this is a PDF, as opposed to HTML or whatever, all the time. <coughs> so that, that's what um, gets produced and pinged off each time an item is downloaded. So the institution, but that's what the tracker code does, the patch that we talk about. Bundles that up together and shoots it off to us in IRS. IRUS, IRS, not IRS. Uh, we moved from monthly to daily processing uh, because the units of recovery is shorter and we have to restate it, etc. Et uh, but basically a Perl script, this is essentially database independent, but the Perl script parses the, the logs that we get, so the daily log file. Uh, it sorts and filters, so we chop out robots and double clicks and that kind of thing the counter uh, suggests. So we consolidate it as a, a number of counts for each of the different items that are within that, that log file. So we end up an intermediate file that basically has a load of IDs with one, two, whatever the count should be. We then, <coughs> and this is something that's different from when uh, Paul presented this at, um, uh, at OR12, we've now split this, so there's now there is step two and step three. Step two um, is to take the output file and load it into the database. But when it, if an item was unknown, so this is the first time it had been downloaded, hadn't been downloaded before, um, we used to then try and get hold of the metadata for it, but that introduced a stumbling block. So to make it quicker, it just goes in with most of the metadata unknown. So there's, you've got the identifier from the IR, there's been a download event or a series of download events, so you put that in, but it's now a known unknown. Sorry to get into yeah. <laughs> So we've got the knowns, the metadata is already filled in, we put a count for that day, and then we now know there's some unknowns, we've got to identify no metadata for it, but the count goes in. Separately then, for the known unknowns, we just do an OAI get record to retrieve the metadata. And we can repeat this at any time. So if something was restated, um, equally you could, you could say, run this, ignoring that, and you could do a full harvest. So a complete metadata refresh if you wanted to. I'm going to nip into the live service unless there are any questions of clarification before I show you. A few people there frowning, so. Uh, I, you, you saw I used a ship login to get in. Um, this is in a production environment. I know Andrew said before it goes live, but I think that's really talking about you know scale and momentum and that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're live now. We, we did have um, six repositories originally. Only one of them was Harvard uh, in, in Paris too. Uh, we've got we've got six now because uh, Reading joined last month. Uh, but we went ahead with the original um, pilots uh, implementers. So th this is this is live data. This is daily updates. So there's a total here of the number of items that have been downloaded from that repository, distinct items, the number of downloads uh, from, we started in July, so this goes through to the end of October, so uh, total, and then this month so far, how many distinct items have been downloaded, how many times, and what's the total? So it's just a, uh, an overall benchmark idea. But those numbers are, um, well, certainly higher than I thought they would be, if you're getting into hundreds of thousands. We've got a number of things that we just started off showing, so uh, the difference between DSpace and imprints and the items downloaded. Item types, um, as I said, this isn't just articles. So. Uh, we had to define a mapping of uh, whatever we found this object to be declared as within the institutional repository to an item type that's within IRIS. So it's a, uh, 
we're just trying to group things together. And I'll, I'll come back to that as we've uh, led on to another piece of work that JISC asked, asked us to do. So the things that we can recognize categorically as articles, we've got books, book chapters, book sections, um, conference workshop items, data set, exam papers. I've just realized that uh, Paul's changed this since Friday. So, <laughs> that's probably not in my screenshot, um, which is in the presentation. Right, we agreed this yesterday, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't last Friday, but yesterday, that a book would go in as a separate item. We weren't expecting entire books to be there. Uh, I think they were lumped in other before. An exam paper, we haven't expected it to be quite such a high number of items that are reference one. So, he's restated the stats. Um, there are manuals, we've still got others, there are presentations, reports, technical reports. Um, that there is some distinction between the two, apparently, that matters. Uh, thesis, dissertation, unknowns, and uh, working papers. And I was quite surprised to see that the thesis, I mean, there's 3,000 there, articles, uh, just shy of 7,000, workshop items, 36, exam papers, 2,500. I mean, they're, they're quite large numbers comparatively. If I just scroll down a bit, we keep a record of what the original type was in the repository. So this is uh, an example of, okay, the iris type has so far received things that in the repository have been called these things. So article peer reviewed, article non peer reviewed, article post print, post print recording oral, uh, etc. The, the list goes on. And we have to, we've done a, uh, a report. We, we can restate. So if there was a change to say, oh, no, well, we need to pull out articles that are oral recordings as a separate, we can just re redo it and represent it as uh, Paul has done. This, this just goes on a bit. And we've just gone through for GIST, looking at um, the various item types that have been defined before in various application profiles, and open air, and driver, and looked at how they pan out in stuff that is in repositories. We're not being repository police here. We're just reporting on what was in the metadata that was there. <coughs> but it's an opportunity for someone to react to it. But we will come out with a recommended mapping and as, again, as part of the information that we'll pass back to you, uh, we could say uh, your item has been mapped to book chapter or book section as an item, and you could have that as a separate item recorded in metadata and supplement what's already there. If that makes sense. Um, so then we weren't the police. One of the things that we looked at was okay, of those of the articles we found, how many had DOIs that we could look out. Uh, we would recommend that you put the DOI in uh, the D an identify field as a separate entity. Don't bury it in some of the full text, which is what happens at Mocha F Um So poor old Bournemouth have it in basically a citation field, but DOIs, you basically you don't really know when they finish, so they're very hard to parse out of just a free text uh, field. Um, but uh, I know with Big City, they've gone back and they're changing it. And what they did was they taught, they were able to say, ah, they're in, they're actually in this, uh, I forget which field it is, but it's a basically free text field, but they're always of this format. So Paul just coded in an exception. But without that to go on, we can't do it. But we could pass it back, and if you can record it as a separate identifier item, you don't need to touch what's already there, you just supplement the metadata, bang, it works. Um, okay. On the search side, we, we uh, haven't done very much of this, but um, when some of the, um, I think it was Reading, started a, a discussion on the email discussion list as to, oh, how do we do this? Because um, they were they were getting they announced it or something at a departmental uh, meeting, and of course. First thing the academics do is go and search for themselves and how things have been downloaded. So here's a, a search for Moya, which is a, a, an author search, and there are 
a number of things here of articles, conference workshop items, theses. Um, and it's, it, that, that's quite a, uh, a well known paper, so it's what, 2,414 downloads. Uh, but you know, the theses has already been downloaded 86 times as well. There's endless opportunity for us to make all these things clickable and to go off back to the IRs. We've deliberately kept the UI simple, waiting for proper user feedback. The ingest stats, that's what we take in, that's the raw data. That's the number that we discount because we can recognize they're from robots. That's the number that get discounted because they're double clicks according to counter. Counter, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, if it's a double click for HTML uh, within 10 seconds, it's regarded as being uh, a double click. No, sorry, if, you've, if within 10 seconds uh, a request is made for the same HTML file from the same IP address, that's a double click to be discounted, and it's 30 seconds for PDF because they take long. So that's what's left with the filter data out. So poor old Bournemouth is getting half of the years of 2 million, uh, but that's reduced down to 105 that we'd actually count. And these will be overstated because we don't have any kind of community policy yet to say how can we improve on the list that counter is defined for the robots, which is set in stone at a particular time because it's for audit purposes. Um, but uh, the double clicks, okay, that's a uh, to try and uh, replicate what happens in, with a use behavior, take account of that. <coughs> counter is for. Um, we've introduced the notion of spikes, um, be they high or low, and there is an algorithm that's been uh, defined for those. But that's the kind of policy that we want to introduce probably after having a year's data, because the counter release four one says things like it's based on your yearly average. So down here, the reports, there's a uh, one of the things that we did with the for, and recommended to counter when we were looking at the article level reports was to define a number of them. So there was an AR1, AR2, and a consolidated article report, which is CAR1. Here is an item report. So this is moving away from articles. So we're now into essentially an IRIS code of practice because it's spreading it wider. Okay. So if I just click on that, uh, I'll just see the recent data. Um, there, there are sort options here. Um, we did change the default because it originally sort of came out in item identifier order, but the first thing everybody wants to do is uh, sort into number of downloads and descending order. Um, so we have put the idea, the ID, the item, the title, and the number of downloads. Uh, and that's available as a, an XML file with additional fields, but that, that's just a, uh, easy on the eye, and you can get it up across to the article itself. This one is a proper counter compliant one. So this is a consolidated article report. So it's restricted to the things that we mapped to multiple time. Therefore, they have to have a DOI to appear because you have to have an identifier in order to get into a counter report. But we may we may have derived it. I'll just put the last month to give uh, other sites apart from Cranfield a chance. Salford, they're further in. So uh, these are the DOIs, that's the source identifier, that's the repository that came from Blackboard and a number of downloads last month. And they're available up there in XML format and via sushi. So you can harvest that or all, all this data back to the repository via sushi. One of the things we wanted to do was to work with these standards because these standards have been defined in order to do this, to transport 
specific information to and fro. So uh, coming up with new standards to allow different kind of harvesting for particular groups uh, hasn't been our priority. It's been to say these standards exist, we conform to those, you conform to those, then we'll talk. Just to show you these exist, we should bore them out. Okay, so uh, I mean you can you can tell from the scroll bar that there's a fair amount in people who just bought them, so that's the XML. Um, and one of the th comments that I would make um, is that for a consolidated article report that is counter compliant, if we had all 150 institutional repositories in and you try and run that for a year, it's a hell of a fine. <laughs> so we may be going back, because I'm a counter technical advisory group, to think about okay, how do we optimize the, the transport of files that are this big. And it's one of the reasons that Elsevier, I mean, I, I dread to think how big, if, if you went, went to them and said, okay, give me an article level breakdown of every article that's been accessed, man, it, the, the file would be too big for you to, um, uh, to process. There has to be some lighter weight version of it. I would suggest. Back to this. <coughs> so that stuff, that various formats, or different ones, uh, but Sushi is the key one. Um, and APIs, yes, we're, we're happy to make this available if somebody says what they would want the API to do and how they would want it to respond. But you can get all that data directly and locally process it. So unless it's a specific need, we haven't you know, come up with one. Bournemouth City, Huddersfield, uh, Reading, Salford, they're the e-prints ones. Cranfield are in the D space, and uh, 10 are currently testing at the moment. Um, uh, I've said to Andrew before, the, the waiting, it's like, we've got some, these guys are in surgery, and some of that, well, <laughs> in the <company. laughs> My waiting room is full. We've got 10 in triage at the moment, but the, the waiting room is, 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 is full. However, we can't go any faster than you can go, and you need to put the patch in that allows the sport to track it go. It's quite simple, but we understand you have to test it, and you'll have to test it in a pre-production environment before you then put it into production. And that kind of version won't necessarily be on your control. But it's quite simple to, to start off with. So Reading, we're in within, I don't know, I think it was two weeks of them saying, yes, we'd like to play. Mm. Sorry, play, trivialise it. But this is this is live data. This is happening. So the stuff's being collected today, and it'll be different tomorrow. And it's all in a production environment on my server. So, uh, it, as I say, this is not a prototype, and, I, and we're not playing with this stuff. Right. So we are working on those ingest scripts, and changing them. And as I've just seen, uh, there are changes that happen overnight. But we do want to spread the word about it. Um, the UI will remain basic until we can react to established user requirements. Uh, so it's all this good stuff working within repository net, community engagement, and then process to support this stuff. We will have um, formal account compliance, but again, I'd recommend that it was only done by us who were hosting it, because if we go for formal account compliance, that involves an audit, which involves cost, and it seems daft, try and uh, uh, replicate audit requirements for every single institutional repository. Okay. Um, for general inquiries, please put them via repository nets because they keep track of them and then you can send in inquiries that include multiple tables and they can gather it all together and you get a combined response. If you want to join the queue, if you send it to rs5.ck, you'll automatically go in the queue and you'll, you, you will be monitored and escalated. So at that stage, if, if that's what you want, if you just give us a shout, we'll give you back full details and you'll be formally entered into the queue. 
essentially like taking the number and sitting in the octopus. It's just that some of you will be dealt with faster than others. Is that all right? Okay. Um, in print, it's obviously a lot quicker if um, Big Southampton are hosting your ePrint repository or indeed managing it because then you just get on the phone to the nice people in Southampton and say, please, will you implement the patch? And uh, for ePrint, as Tim Brody wrote it, uh, he's quite accommodating. Um, just say for DSpace, we um, contracted Atmire to provide the code, and there are, um, I think, there's a compatible version for, I think, three different releases. There isn't one for 3.0 yet, because the functionality that was in 3 was frozen quite a long time ago, uh, although we could commission it. So it, I mean, from when we were doing the survey before, there were quite a few people who were thinking about going to 2.8, but it was quite a big leap anyway. Um, Chris, I'm conscious you're there, and I haven't mentioned Fedora. Um, in Pyrus originally, we did get, we did include uh, Oxford, and had a working instance of this with their Fedora instance, which we didn't get working at home. Um, Fedora, we are interested in doing it. With, I mean, there are, as far as I'm aware, three significant, um, one of them being at my home institution, the University of Manchester, um, Oxford and Hull. Uh, so they're on the list, but there it's, it's uh, a bit more um, involved. I mean, we have got the instructions on how to implement the track and everything, but we will be doing it. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, that's it. Something else about. Sorry, you do it. Hi, but thanks for that. That's that's great. And I mean, again, this is another thing that I think is is brilliant. Um, I suppose I'm interested in, on a personal note as well. I mean, I have a commercial software platform. It's going to make it quite tricky for me to implement this code. It requires bespoke work with them to the extent that I'm even thinking of advocating a move to something like Ethereum. I mean, and I, I and you've mentioned Fedora. I expect there's challenges for that longer tail of, of repositories that are. I mean, these basic things make it relatively straightforward, but there are, I'm imagining, challenges with that longer tail of yeah. other types of software. Yeah. I mean, are you envisaging that you will get all 150, or is that just an ideal, really? I mean, it'll be the eSprint e print ones, then the D space ones. However fast they go, that's like slower. Um, then it'll be Fedora, which is dependent on work in the institution. Then it'll be people who've got their own proprietary solutions brought in because then it's between you and the technology provider to say, okay, I'd like to conform to, it could be just the counter code practice, but that's an industry standard. The, the PLOS is working too. I mean, they took the power of stuff and just ran with it. Um, um, and to mention Core again, I don't know if you spoke to them because they cash full text. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've had any layers with them. Um, no. no. All, all we're doing, and Andrew will be sick of hearing me say it. I want to do something that's very simple, or I want to do it well, and then we can build it, and other people can just can add in. But well, people like to come to you and, yeah. and, and discuss how that it might work for them. And th I mean, there is the small issue of funding as well. So we're being funded. It's half an FTE is doing the development and the application coding, and then it's a quarter of a person basically who's doing the management and reporting. And then we've got uh, eight days to, uh, funded to do the evaluation. That's across the year. So there's limited scope to start looking at uh, proprietary solutions. But the, the standards are documented. So it could be up to your technology provider to say, you know, next year, what are your plans for uh, counter article level compliance? <coughs> it, they should know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, if no, not, they do. Then I've told them. But <laughs> 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 Thanks. I was wondering if you should mention something about you know, um, your PMC, not the UK PMC, for the first time. Because um, we've, uh, as was mentioned, we've um, we've now got a, I've now got a work package. Sorry, I'm the service manager for, for your PMC Plus as well. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was use Positive Junction to um, address the issue of, well, people say, you shouldn't put them in the subject repository straight away, it should be harvesting from institutional repositories. But if you did that, then we wouldn't actually have uh, a PubMed Central because 
the, at the moment the institutional repository is empty. So it's, it's kind of the start of a term. But what we've agreed is uh, as a work package for next year, so this will be starting first quarter next year, is uh, that for every article that uh, is ingested overnight into your PMC, uh, we'll pull out the canonical URL metadata information about it and pass the whole thing to Repository Junction. We will then sift through and say, yes, I know about this institution and I know where to send it, and it'll get sent. The met it'll be metadata plus a link back to your PMC. It's up to you if you then want to download the full text and can deal with embargoes and that kind of stuff and store them. But, um, we will always have, it'll be a pointer back to the definitive version because we get an awful lot of uh, withdrawn, updated uh, articles, that kind of thing. So I know there's a managed environment over here and if we just look at the updates, then we can control how much gets uh, sprayed out, if you like, in references in the regular metadata, if that makes sense. So that's the approach to be done. Yeah. Do you think um, <clears throat> Iris UK could provide some rationale for deduplicating? Um, in, in case we, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of uh, RevNet future services, in case we went for an aggregation of metadata, uh, you, you seem to be doing like the opposite process in a way, uh, probably with the title and the DOI could reach for detecting or identifying duplicates. But we could spray out what we find when we're doing what we're currently being tasked to do, uh, which is, you know, okay, there's been a usage event here, what, what did it affect <coughs> those things? And these appear to be the same things. Uh, to say that is the same as that requires a, a, an authority that we don't currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as I say, that, that thing of finding the DOI meant that we've gone into the metadata and uh, five star, if there's, a metadata, if there's a DOI there, great. If you've got a fully populated metadata record, you're actually down about three stars anyway, because when you try and find a DOI for that, you get an awful lot of noise. If you haven't got a fully populated metadata record, you may as well not bother. It's just noise. And if we can't find it, then nobody's going to be downloading it, so it's not going to be one of those high, high numbers. So. Sorry, I'm ranting. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. How does it, so if someone's got um, IR stats installed on yeah. Prince, how does it compare? Will the stats be different from the way yes. that you filter out robots? Uh, like they, they will be different and IR stats is a much more mature, fully functional product because yeah. it's been developed over however many years to work with IR stats. So it's, it's, it, that's what you want to be looking at for your close inspection. Okay, so this is just broad brush, this yeah. is to enable trends and baselines and stuff, and that's why I made that point about um, they will be overstated. Yeah. And we know for a fact that um, a lot of the dissertations and theses, the number of downloads there are surprisingly high, and then Paul did look at a few of them, and they all tend to be around you know, one machine or a small spread of IP addresses. So it's probably the student themselves mm. <laughs> gaming it. But as I say, after a year, that's the kind of policy that we could agree to introduce. We've also had issues with their um, particularly with thesis records. Uh, it seems to be those that are getting picked up because yeah. we've had a couple of denial of service attacks to come to ground. Yeah. Um, and it's actually been the theses that have been targeted rather than the articles. Yeah. Um, so again. It would just be the student gaming. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I'd do it myself. I'd do it myself. Well, actually, they're probably going, oh yes, Peter, what's the record? Oh, 30 seconds. Okay, 31. You can see counter. But there's, um, I mean, we, we did go back and find that there are uh, a number of library instances in China uh, who are basically just downloading anything they can find in a systematic way. And then they're, they're not known as robots, so that they're not declared as a, not on a robot list, but um, that's the kind of thing that should be part of a shared list of threats, <coughs> robots, and then known things that should be on a blacklist, but I think that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, would have to be community-led uh, and shared for most value. <coughs> 
that IR stats do do a lot of that. So that, yeah. I'm sure. Um, so when this goes live, does that mean that anyone can log on and view the stats, or will it be restricted to a set group? No. Uh, will it be publicly, you, publicly you will, available? If you're participating, yeah. you'll be able to get in, okay. and you'll be able to see the stats for yourself and everybody else who's participating. So what we're requiring at the moment is open access to those those stats. Yeah. I don't really want them, but just when you said yeah, an author wants to go in and search, they won't be able to do that then. It'll just be no, the author if they're a member of your institution, oh, okay. yes. Right. Yeah. So that could lead to gaming potential, I suppose, could not it? Anyway. Chicken and egg. I, I, if 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 you make the thing important, then someone will try and game it. At the moment I don't know what's to be gained from having a lot of downloads because nobody sees where the downloads are because something like this doesn't exist. But then when you put it there. Just going back quickly if I made the point that, that you mentioned earlier on about core. Core, core as you know, trolls all of the institutional repositories in the UK and, yeah. and, 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 and caches the, the PDFs they all can see download everything there. Now presumably that's not picked up by our stats or by or by ours. Is that a an issue we should be worrying about because it will be distorting the statistics. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, that's one I would uh, put into that, but we should be discounting that because it's basically going into a cache. It's not a true usage download. Oh, sorry, no, I was meaning that if people download it from Core and don't oh, right. download it from the Force repository, we're not getting a true a true overall national statistic of the number of downloads. I'm, I'm not sure whether you're, are you picking up statistics of, of downloads from Core? No. Be, no. Yeah, so, but that, so that should be another element. So none of the subject repositories yeah. are providing us with usage statistics. And your PMC won't be providing downloads of usage statistics. I appreciate everybody's really got into that conversation. <laughs> um, but we have only got a very limited time to actually have anything to eat for lunch. So 